G'day, it's Paul Rowe, and we're tracking the steps of Jesus with Luke in his gospel. Now, we've learned that Luke is a good historian. That uh, pleases my heart. And in chapter 2, where we pick up the story of Jesus and Mary and Joseph, he gives us a reference point there. Caesar, over in Rome, 2,000 kilometres away, calls a census, which means he's going to number all the people in his empire. Why? Well... Uh, it's a taxation question, really. It's a power trip. He needs to know how many people he's got so he can tax them. And why does he want to tax them? Well, he's got a whole empire to look after. The famous Roman roads are being built everywhere, aqueducts, cities, and so on. So it's really the iron fist of Rome controlling everybody in the empire, telling them, you go down to your home city and get registered so we can tax you more effectively. Well... That was Caesar's take on it, but uh, there was another plan afoot. He didn't realise us that young couple were tracking all the way down 120 kilometres, probably on a donkey, uh, for a pregnant girl. They were just a young couple. They were nothing. They were just another number in the empire. But in another scheme, uh, there was a greater plan afoot than Caesar even could begin to imagine. A new kingdom was going to be established that would overarch all the kingdoms of the world eventually and Rome would soon be forgotten. Caesar would be just a bust in some temple somewhere. But this king was going to establish something quite extraordinary, this little baby that was going to be born. So uh, it's not just uh, Luke's idea. He tracks it to a particular place, to Bethlehem, and we know from the uh, prophecies in the Old Testament or the Old Jewish part of the Bible, uh, 700 years before a prophet called Micah in Israel had said, you know, someone is going to come from the tribe of Judah who is going to fulfill all our dreams of somehow Israel being established and the Messiah, the great rescuer coming. So um, this 700 year old prophecy was this, listen to it. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you're only small amongst the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel. And uh, he goes on to say he's going to be the shepherd of the flock and he's going to bring security and his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Well, 2,000 years later, we, here we are. I'm in Dubbo, half a, half a world away from the little town of Bethlehem. But... In a month or two's time, we're going to be celebrating the birth of Jesus. Even the people who don't really believe in him, they're going to be somehow remembering the birth of this little baby. And that says something to me about the enormity of this story. It's bigger than Caesar could have imagined, bigger than Joseph and Mary probably even realised at the time. So um, we move on to uh, verse 8, and uh, or a little bit before that, verse 5. Uh, the baby's born, and it's in such poor circumstances. You know the story, I suppose, but um, there was no room when they got there uh, because there's a flood of people going back there. All the beds were taken. They find a little stable, and there the baby is born. And that's amazing, isn't it, in that simple circumstance that somebody who was going to, I think C.S. Lewis said, some, one time in a, in a little stable, someone was born who was bigger than the whole universe. Well, there's a thought. Um, and Mary must have been wondering, Joseph must have been wondering, after seeing angels and having all that given to them, here we are in a stable, <laughs> and this baby's been born here in, in the straw, animals. Uh, it must have been, for them, just a staggering thing. But like most parents, uh, Joseph must have had to act as midwife, I guess, unless there were some women around. Um, and... Um, Here's this child, and they both know that it's not been conceived normally. It's an extraordinary child. And William Blake, I remember, wrote a poem that says, My, f my mother groaned, my father wept, and into the dangerous world I <laughs> leapt. Well, that's pretty much what happened to Jesus. He comes into this world just like we do as a baby born uh, from a human mother. And uh, as they cut the umbilical cord and they laid the little child in the swaddling clothes, um, you can imagine that's in their mind. Well, who is he? What is this child? He looks pretty much like any other child. Uh, there's nothing particularly extraordinary about him. Um, what would he be like? And who could they tell? Because who's really going to understand 
the extraordinary nature of this story. And um, I guess their celebration would have been muted by doubts uh, with the family. Uh, and at this moment, I guess they must have felt very, very alone. In all the world, they only had each other. Well, all around them, something else is about to happen. A massive host of heavenly beings had been gathering. And they didn't see this um, until nearby, there's a group of stockmen, shepherds, uh, very Australian soon, I suppose, looking after stock out in the, in the paddock. And probably the kind of practical men that aren't easily thrown by a surprise. But when an angel bathed in light appears in front of them and tells them not to be afraid, it's always slightly shocking, isn't it? They think, what would I do? But um, they're given this announcement. A, gr a group of working men are given this this opportunity. Traders, I suppose we'd call them almost. Stockmen. Um, unnamed men. We don't even know their names. But it, somehow God chose to signal this great event. Uh, Caesar's got his plans. God's got his plans. And his design is to reach into the world through the most ordinary, the most humble, the most unpretentious, um, that this good news of the kingdom of God was going to be carried by pretty ordinary people, um, all familiar with the, the practicalities of life. Joseph was a carpenter. Um, Mary was a, a girl, probably just a normal peasant girl growing up in a, a village. And the shepherds get the message. Well, um, it tells you something, doesn't it, about how God works and what he's, the way he deals, this, how this plan is going to unfold for the whole world. Well, this great message that the shepherds receive, um, it, it, it's announced as good news that will bring great joy to all the world. And uh, I think C.S. Lewis said, the joy is the serious business of heaven. And somehow that heaven is full to overflowing with joy. I think the old psalm says, in God's presence is fullness of joy. And what I think is happening here is that that joy that fills heaven and pulses in heaven that the angels are kind of singing to is almost like they couldn't hold it back any longer. And somehow the curtain has to part just briefly for a moment to this ordinary group of men. And suddenly the sky fills with angels. Well, we lived at Burke for a while. And when you live at Burke, it's very flat. And you can see 360 degrees of sky when you look in every direction. And uh, I tried to picture some nights out there looking up thinking, imagine a sky full of angels. Uh, it would have been just amazing, just singing, you know, um, and the sheer exhilaration of heaven spills into the lives of these very ordinary men. Um, they were sort of filled with fear and astonishment, um, but the angels can only see great triumph breaking into the world. And that carol that we sing, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth, earth receive her king, written by Isaac Watts a couple of hundred years ago. It stems from Psalm 98, and it's a call to men to compose a new song, uh, telling of the way God has acted powerfully in your life. And I guess, in a way, for us, it's the same, isn't it? God's saying, uh, compose a new song in your time, in your space, uh, when the good news breaks in on you so that that serious business of heaven, joy, uh, should be the stamp and the mark of Christians everywhere who take this good news, the story of Jesus, not just a little baby born in a manger at Christmas time with all the tinsel, but a person who's going to overtake the whole of the Roman Empire eventually, who's going to overtake the kingdoms of the world, who's going to fill the world with his glory one day. Well, um, I think the old song says he's the Lord of the dance. And I like that idea, the idea that he started uh, this music of heaven is still with us. It's there. And Jesus was dancing to the music of heaven. He was never tuned just into this, the ugly music of earth, which sort of struggles to sort of get it together. And it's full, like you turn the news on every day and it's full of sadness and tragedy and so on. But the music of heaven sort of rises above that and as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, a believer in this story, Luke wants us, I think, to capture that spirit and say, this is the launching point of the good news of Jesus. It's a joyful event and we should never forget that. And um, 
Uh, he saw the day, Jesus saw the day when he was going to bring many, many sons to glory. In fact, the old psalm said, those that sow in tears will doubtless come rejoicing, bringing in the harvest. And uh, so sometimes we see it as a struggle, and it is. It's not easy in this world. But keep looking forward. I think that's what Jesus kept saying to his disciples. Eventually he starts saying, look around and see the harvest. It just needs harvesters. We're going to bring this tremendous harvest in that's going to be a harvest of people, of souls. Or in the case of the fishermen, like a great haul of fish. Um, and it's going to bring these people, men and women, boys and girls, home into the kingdom of God. And that's what he saw. That's what was the energy in Jesus' life. And um, you know, that song, that hymn says, repeat the sounding joy. Um, let your life be kind of a sounding board for this joyous event. Um, rejoice in the Lord always, Paul said. And again, I say rejoice. So I like that. I like this start to the, the story of Jesus, even though there's this sort of uh, terrible things happening all around them. Rome is such a powerful kingdom. King Herod is kind of this ugly, bitter, horrible man who's sort of poised there to sort of control his little bit of the empire. But this heavenly host saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, on to all those who God's favour rests. So think about, fix that in your mind as the, the real launching point for the story. Uh, a great joyous event in a very simple and humble circumstance that's going to grow and grow and grow and outshine, outlast outdo the kingdoms of this world. I think somebody said that um, the Christians eventually, they outlived, they outloved, and then they outdied the pagans. Somehow the Christian kingdom, the true Christian kingdom, not just Christendom, uh, is going to carry this message of joy to the world. And that's how the story begins.